Hello and thanks for joining us. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you all to this session to discuss the best use of CT and MRI imaging modalities. Please do pop any questions that you may have uh, during the session in the Q&A section you should see at the bottom of your screen and we'll field those to Mimi at the end. This webinar will also be free to watch back on our YouTube channel if you need to head off during the session at all. For those of you who don't know about CT, we're delighted to host the session as part of our commitment to education and supporting veterinary teams. We provide two main services to veterinary clinics, teleradiology and teleconsulting. Teleradiology is remote reporting of your X-ray, CT and MRI images for all species, with experts such as Mimi providing detailed clinical, clinically relevant reports to provide you with diagnostic confidence and peace of mind with your imaging. We have round the clock customer service and 24 seven rapid turnaround times. So our team are here whenever you need us. Through teleconsulting, which is our multidisciplinary specialist team, they act like a vir virtual extension of your team, increasing access to specialist advice and care for your patients. This service enables you to offer a form of in-house referral, while our specialists help and advise you on case management and work with you to support great outcomes for your patients. It is also a great way to advance your knowledge and skills as we provide you with ongoing patient side support, reassurance and clinical mentoring. To find out more, please feel free to message us in the chat or email info at vet-ct.com. And if you don't want to miss out on future webinars, sign up to our newsletter or um, via the website or follow us on social media. Right, thanks for listening. I'm now going to hand over to Mimi, who's going to talk about the use of CT and MRI. Over to you, Mimi. Thank you, David. Uh, and welcome, everybody. I will start my presentation. So today I'm going to talk a bit about which imaging modality is best for your patient and mostly focusing on CT and MRI, so cross-sectional imaging. And for those of you who get confused with my name, my Actual birth name is Meria, but everybody calls me Mimi. And since in Vet City we are like a little family, everybody call me with that name here too. First, uh, a short discussion on what constitutes of an optimal imaging modality. The modality should most reliably give a correct enough diagnosis in an appropriate time frame. And what is correct enough depends on case by case. It should provide, however, all relevant information to the case to decide prognosis and choose appropriate treatment. Uh, it should, of course, be safest and least invasive possible procedure. And when we compare, for example, CT and radiography with MRI, CT and radiography has the disadvantage of radiation that we have to get protected. In add to that, with CT and radiography myelographic studies, we need to inject intrathecally contrast media, so that is an invasive procedure, whereas with MRI, if we want to obtain myelographic images, we can use special sequencing and we do not need any needles. The optimal imaging modality is also cost efficient, not necessarily initially uh, the least expensive. And with that, we often also need to take into account whether the patient is insured or not. And also, even if the patient has insurance, what other potentially expensive procedures will follow, because at least here in Finland, the pet insurances do not cover tens of thousands of euros worth studies and uh, treatments. In the end, the optimal imaging modality depends what is best for the patient as well as the owner, so good uh, communication with the client is always important. Things are constantly changing and evolving in the veterinary medicine field, and CT has been one of the biggest revolutions in diagnostic imaging since 
the advent of ultrasound. Both CT and MRI as at an, at an advanced imaging method are changing the way we work up and diagnose our patients already. There's more and more knowledge and evidence-based research. The CT and MRI protocols are now often optimized for animals, which again improves further the diagnostic quality and accuracy compared to what it used to be like 20 years ago. The basic principles of indications for advanced imaging, so to say CT and MRI, have not changed that much in the last 20 years, despite everything. As the grand old lady Ruth Dennis uh, published already 2003, the basic principles for the indications are when an area that we suspect with pathology cannot be evaluated by other means, for example, intracranial or brain disease, that would be the major indication for cross-sectional imaging. If the information produced by more conventional techniques is limited, such as with spinal, nasal, or tympanic bulla disease, or more detailed anatomical information is needed, such as in the case of portosystemic shunting or ectopic uretures or some thoracic pathologies. Sometimes we simply need more uh, three-dimensional information, for example, from fracture morphology or uh, to evaluate an invasiveness of adrenal mass. With technology becoming faster, um, the scans can now be made even in light sedation or awake with the help of this lovely invention of a wet mouse trap that was invented by Dr. Bob O'Brien in Illinois University, who also happens to me, be my former PhD supervisor. Actually, the device should be called cat or dog mouse trap instead of wet mouse trap. Um, it allows the patient to be still or relatively still while scanning and that has given us the advantage of scan patients that previously couldn't go to CT because they would not be able to tolerate with heavy anesthetic protocols such as patients with laryngeal problems or other dyspneic patients. Let's talk a little about comparison of CT with ultrasound and radiographs. There are several publications comparing these modalities in the past 15 years. It has been uh, proven that CT is superior to ultrasound when it comes to imaging the abdominal cavity of larger patients. Despite that the overall soft tissue resolution of ultrasound is superior when compared to CT and especially compared to radiographs. That means that the soft tissue resolution of CT is not always as good, but with good imaging technique and scan protocol and with help of intravenous contrast media, uh, it is adequate enough. The other advantage of CT is that we can see more and in three dimension, and it is less operator dependent, especially when the scan protocols are optimized. This is very helpful in planning for therapy and is very helpful also for our surgeons. Please don't get defended, but at least to my understanding for a lot of surgeons, it is easier to have the images in sagittal or dorsal plane compared to the transverse plane that we radiologists prefer. Despite everything, I'd still consider radiographs as the first modality of choice for any acutely vomiting patients on your 
clinic or duty time. When comparing CT with ultrasound, we are all probably well aware of the physical limitations of ultrasound when it comes to large patient size, gas within the gastrointestinal tract or abdominal cavity, or structures that are hidden deep in body cavities or behind pelvic bones or other bones. CT does not have these limitations. However, for example, gastric wall layers are not visible on CT and the gastrointestinal tract contents are not that easy always to determine what type they exactly are. Here you can see on the left lower image a sagittal image of intussusception in an ultrasound and, and a more normal cross-section of small intestine. And here on the right you can see 3D MPR images on CT with a similar case with intussusception. So both modalities can give us a good and accurate diagnosis in this type of disease and which to choose is case based and what type of modalities you have in your clinic. When comparing CT with radiographs, um, CT is far more superior since we have higher scale of densities that we can uh, estimate and calculate. In radiographs, as we all know, there are only five radio opacities and that causes tissues and fluids of similar opacity superimposing and making our life more difficult in patients with, for example, pleural effusion, as in both of these cases. In CT, it doesn't cause that big of a problem because we have the three dimensions and also because we can actually even measure the type of material in the ventral aspects of the thorax in the soft tissue reconstruction. Because of the high scale of different densities that we call attenuation in CT, we need uh, different reconstructions created, such as the bone or lung and soft tissue or standard. Otherwise, it would be difficult to include all of the scales in one image. CT will soon or is already replacing or at least complementing the conventional imaging modalities in many occasions. As said already in the very beginning, cases with complex anatomy or pathology that need more detailed anatomical information is already an indication for CT or MRI. Almost all skull and head imaging already nowadays go rather to CT than to radiographs. A lot of orthopedic patients and especially nearly all of the elbow lameness patients already have CT scans for diagnosis. CT can be very beneficial also for trauma patients, especially when there's multi-trauma or the trauma comes to an anatomical region that has complex anatomy. As said previously, larger patients, abdominal imaging, portosystemic shunts, ectopic ureters, and even sometimes acute abdominal cases will benefit from CT. Oncologic, oncologic patients benefit from CT both as diagnosing as well as staging, and sometimes also for treatment monitoring. Thorax is an area which is good for radiographs, but when things start to go pathologic, we are often less sensitive and specific, and in those occasions, CT can be very helpful. Computed tomography means uh, cutting slices and computing an image. Here we can see a lateral lateral view of the head in radiograph and at the level of the red marker, there are two 
transverse images in cross-section on CT in soft tissue and bone reconstruction and an anatomic illustration at the same level. In CT, we can easily obtain three-dimensional information, whether it is in multiplanar reconstructions, like here on the left in transverse baseline data that cre is created in the sagittal and dorsal reconstructions, or volume rendering image, which is a more uh, anatomical information for everybody. Here, as a comparison, you can see that the 3D volume rendering imaging can give you fast overall look in multi-trauma patient with multiple pelvic fractures and sacroiliac joint luxations. However, as radiologists, we often like the more detailed information that you can gain with multiplanar reconstructions. When comparing CT with MRI, um, both require some level of sedation or anesthesia. Anybody who has ever been in an MRI scanner knows that there is a lot of noise during MRI scan, especially in high field MRI. And that is one of the causes why we need heavy anesthesia for especially MRI. With the advent of faster CTs, the sedation in CT becomes lighter or less needed. The scan protocol is equally important on both modalities for optimal result. In CT, the principles are roughly same as in radiographs to obtain good signal to noise ratio and image detail. The major thing in CT that uh, gives us the spatial resolution is the slice thickness and the size of field of view. In MRI, we need uh, different sequences and in both imaging modalities, good patient positioning, as well as good clinical history and question, what do we actually want to gain with the imaging or in MRI accurate neurolocalization prior taking the patient to the scan is very important and has a factor in what kind of protocol we should use. In CT, we can improve the soft tissue resolution with help of contrast material, either intravenously, intrathecally, or in lymphatic system. That does have some contraindications because it's ionizing contrast media. I'm not going too much into detail with that, but uh, I'm sure there is a full of information from Google, or you can ask in the questions section. With MRI, we can equally use paramagnetic intravenous contrast media to show whether a lesion has contrast enhancement or not. However, for myelographic and angiographic effects, we do not need contrast on MRI. With CT, we can do dynamic studies for shunts and anything cardiovascular or even for urography. And with CT, there's an option for CT guided biopsies. Despite all the good things about MRI and its uh, superiority compared to CT, especially with neuroimaging, small patient size and larger scan areas, especially in low field MRI can be a challenge. Here is an example of CT myelography in transverse and sagittal from the neck and from thoracolumbar spine and in MRI, basic T2 weighted sagittal sequence and the Richman's 
myelogram haste sequence that does not give as nice signal to noise ratio, but has a really nice contrast resolution and shows the major areas where the discs are extruding. MRI is not quite as intuitive as CT, and like I mentioned briefly, the MRI is based on the sequences that we choose, and often there are several different sequences that we need to choose, most commonly T1 and T2 weighted, as well as the same sequences potentially also in different imaging planes. Here is a patient with hydrocephalus and fluid distended ventricles. CT can give us similar information in another patient, but as you can see in comparison, the soft tissue resolution is significantly poorer when compared with MRI. The MRI sequences that we can use can be specific, for example, for fat or blood or other types of tissues. Like said, in MRI, unlike in CT, we need to obtain each imaging plane separately, and that adds on imaging time. Like in this patient with fibrotic myopathy, the contrast resolution is really nice in these stir images and the pathology is readily visible, although not necessar necessarily the anatomy is as easy to understand with a quick glimpse, like with CT. That being said, a little comparison in this table on scanning times, which because time is an essence, with MRI, you can see the scan times are much longer compared to CT. And please note that these times are for the whole process and not just for image acquisition alone. The number of images obtained is significantly lower in MRI compared to CT, and especially when compared to the more modern multi-slice CTs. The interpretation times are not that significantly different, but you can see that as the number of images increases, so does the interpretation time required, as well as potentially uh, the image transfer time for you clients maybe sending us. So what are the disadvantages of CT and MRI? Firstly, they are more expensive compared to radiographs and ultrasound. The availability of CT and MRI, at least here in Finland, we don't have them in every corner or every city or not even every 200 kilometers. So that can be a challenge. Um, radiation is an issue always with CT and uh, radiographs, and that gives some requirements for the room where you keep the scanner. Metal, anywhere close to the scan area of or area of interest, especially in MRI, creates artifacts and causes issues with image quality. It is less of a problem in CT, but still very close to the larger TPLO implants. We do not get uh, as good image quality as elsewhere. And also with MRI, um, there are specific requirements for the room where you keep the scanner, especially when it's a high field MRI. Like my previous professor and teacher already at vet school, as well as during residency, Marietta Snellman always uh, pointed out, imaging is always a complementary diagnostic imaging for your patient after an, a good comprehensive clinical exam. 
And you should always think what is the question you need an answer to. If you only want to know whether there is a mass or no mass, for example, in an abdomen or a thoracic cavity, that information you can already get with radiographs or ultrasound or combination of both. If you need more detailed information or the anatomy is more complex than maybe cross-sectional imaging is the thing you need. Some examples could be in a hypercalcemic patient that has had weight loss and anorexia, azotemia and vomiting. The client could ask a study is performed to rule in or out neoplasia as a cause for hypercalcemia. And then maybe there are some more specific questions. And which modality to choose? We will go more in detail with the following slides with cases. Just want to point out that echocardiography is still the imaging modality of choice for cardiac patients. When we go into intracranial structures, MRI is the golden standard for imaging. As you can see here in the lower row in T2, T1 pre and post contrast images, we can see the intraaxial mass and the surrounding edema quite nicely, as well as the contrast enhancement. When there is a space occupying large enough mass with contrast enhancement or hemorrhage, like in this CT in pre and post soft tissue reconstructions, CT can also give us some level of information, but not quite as detailed as with MRI. With MRI, when we use specific sequences, we can gain even more information. For example, like in this mass, there are areas with hemorrhage that we can recognize with T2 star uh, sequence. Here is another patient with uh, uh, acute lacunar infarct in the right caudate nucleus. The dog had fainting or seizures three times in the past months and suddenly started to be wobbly. And in T1, there's really basically nothing to my eye. And in T2, we see some hyper intensities, but when we use diffusion weighted imaging and ADC map, the lesion becomes far more conspicuous. With these patients with infarctions, adding on also T2 star or similar sequence can help detecting smaller areas of previous infarcts or microbleeds. When talking about brain and intracranial structures, we should also consider cranial nerves. And here is an example of cases with cranial nerve thickening, such as the trigeminal thickening in this patient. With MRI, we can easily see the difference in the thickness of the trigeminal nerve, as well as the significant uniform contrast enhancement. In CT, on baseline, it's not really conspicuous, but we do see that there is an area of increased contrast uptake and in the bone reconstruction, because this has been slowly progressive and growing process to neoplasia, we can see that the canal where the nerve in, enters the brain is widened. And also in both imaging modalities, the ipsilateral muscle atrophy is readily visible. So both imaging modalities can show some things on these patients, but of course, MRI is superior. When we are talking about head, if we go deeper in bony structures such as nasal cavities and middle or inner ear, CT and MRI are both very good to excellence, especially when comparing with radiographs. Of course, when 
disease processes get far enough, they can become also visible on radiographs. But radiographs are not very sensitive as at least 40% of bone loss needs to happen before it becomes visible on radiographs in simple structures. And when we talk about more complex structures, the change needs to be even bigger. In add to that, to obtain these diagnostic quality radiographs, we need special techniques and views which need really precise patient positioning and skill. Whereas when we go to CT or MRI, uh, they are both really good for assessment of nasal turbinates and sinuses. With MRI, we get better soft tissue information on the type of process within. We can see on the right side, there is gas, and on the left side, there is something more of soft tissue intensity with contrast enhancement. In CT, the soft tissue resolution is not quite that good, and sometimes it is not that easy to detect whether there is a real mass or not. But with CT, the advantage is that the bone lysis as well as the turbinate loss is more easy to detect. That being said, one of the clinically important information in these patients is whether the cripriform plate is intact or not. And that is far easier to detect with the help of CT when compared to MRI. Here in 3D MPR images on CT, we can see that there is the contrast enhancement that continues across the bone lysis. And in these patients where we suspect uh, cripriform plate lysis, sometimes for a treatment as well as prognosis, the next important question is whether there is already intracranial structures involved, either meningeal enhancement or even enhancement of the brain parenchyma. And MRI is far superior on that assessment. MRI can, although it doesn't always show the bone lysis as nicely as CT, it can still show when things continue beyond their normal structures or borders. When we go into the middle and inner ear, both CT and MRI can be used. With CT, we can see again the nice changes in the bones, whether it is a new bone proliferation or bone lysis, as well as the expansile nature on the right tympanic mbula. Also with CT, we have some degree of information on the soft tissue contents, whether we measure it or visually estimate there is a difference between right and left in the attenuation, as well as whether we see an obvious contrast enhancement or not. In this case, we don't. With MRI, the bony changes are not quite that easily observable. However, the contents of the tympanic bulla and ch any changes in the inner ear and cochlea are far better visible. And also any changes in the surrounding tissues and the contrast enhancement of the contents and surrounding tissues. Both of these patients had cholesteatoma and if you suspect cholesteatoma, MRI would currently be considered as the imaging modality of choice, although CT does give, off, give us also some information to guide us towards the correct diagnosis. When you have a patient that has difficulties opening the mouth, your focus turns into retrobulbar space like in these both patients and different pathologies in these regions. 
with MRI, we can detect really nicely any soft tissue changes. We can also uh, assess whether there is optic nerve or intracranial involvement of the process. However, with CT, we get really nice three-dimensional quick information and easier and better understanding of any bone lysis or involvement in the process. Both of these patients had different types of malignant aggressive sarcoma neoplasia. The battle between CT and MRI in the literature is which one is better for detecting foreign material within the body, cavities or tissues, and it is somewhat controversial or depends on a study as well as on the type of foreign material, as well as on the timing when we do the scanning which ends up being better. Here you can see a CT image with hypoattenuating areas in the retropulbar region and pharyngeal region with mild contrast enhancement. And in MRI, you can see the large foreign object surrounded by fluid and tissue reaction. CT is very good to detect any tracking gas, especially in acutely perforating foreign objects or gas producing infection and abscesses. However, MRI might be more sensitive for any soft tissue changes and fluid, but in the end, it depends on with which modality we get better signal and contrast to noise ratio and what type of biological material there is. There is an area between the head and uh, spine where cross-sectional imaging is really superior to any other modalities, and that is the pharyngeal, laryngeal, and retropharyngeal region, like in these two patients. MRI gives us really nice uh, contrast resolution and readily shows that there is a left-sided retropharyngeal contrast enhancing mass in the upper row patient and on the right side on this CT in the lower row patient. With CT, as said before, we can get really fast three-dimensional nice images with good signal to noise ratio and with MRI, we can see the soft tissue changes and if there are big enough bone changes as in this, my previous talk where the neoplasia had already eaten a lot of the adjacent mandible away, we can get also some information on the bone. But the advantage of MRI when compared to CT is, especially when we are dealing with neoplastic processes, is that we can see if there is any invasion to the skull bones or even within the intracranial structures. Moving on to the spinal cord and seemingly during evening, I'm a bit slower than earlier today, so my apologies if I take a bit of your question time. So today I was planning to talk mostly about head and spine to save some time. And now let's go to the spine. When we are dealing with spine, most commonly we talk about intervertebral disc extrusions and protrusions and whether they cause spinal cord compression that is important for the treatment planning. With MRI, we can see really nicely, usually, if we have good enough signal to noise ratio, the site of compression as well as the degree of compression. So MRI is considered the golden standard. There are some exceptions, especially when dealing with tiny, tiny chihuahuas and uh, uh, lower field MRIs, sometimes the signal to noise ratio may not be that good. 
And in those patients, luckily, they often have mineralized or hemorrhagic extrusions, which can also be visible on CT. Overall, on CT, if we don't quite know how much there is compression or is if there is significant compression, we can add on with either and or intravenous contrast and CT myelographic procedures. However, sometimes uh, it is not so straightforward and simple, and then we may need some special sequencing in MRI to help us to diagnose the patient, like in this case. And that is the case when we have smaller volume of extruding material without uh, significant compression. The advent of T2 three-dimensional images has been very helpful in these cases. And the advantage of MRI over CT is that we see also the intramedullary changes that will help us to focus our eyes on the areas where the teeny tiny lesion has occurred and we see the secondary changes. like the acute non-degenerative mildly or non-compressive nucleus pulposus extrusion of hydrated material. With CT, we can get some information on these patients also, but often they are more indirect and we do not have the information from the intramedullary changes. So what we are looking is uh, tiny areas of hyperattenuating hemorrhage, or if it's partially degenerated disc that has extruded also some hyperattenuating disc material. And with a CT, we cannot really differentiate these two types of material from each other. As you can see with MRI, we get far more detailed information and characterization, and it is much more helpful in these patients. When dealing with fractures, like said before, CT is more informative, especially in the fracture morphology. And there have been studies uh, comparing CT and MRI. Uh, CT is superior when it comes to the fracture anatomy. Uh, like in this patient, you can see that the image detail is far superior on CT compared to MRI. However, the advantage of MRI is that we can see the soft tissue changes surrounding or any changes in the soft tissues in the vertebral canal, which becomes important when there is an unstable fracture. And specific sequences can be helpful in improving the contrast resolution, but sometimes that may mean that the signal to noise ratio will decrease. Here are some more three dimensional images. So with CT, we often see more fractures in the same patient, but not all of these tiny additional fractures are necessarily clinically significant. And the same study actually showed that when it comes to clinically significant fractures and unstable fractures, the comparison between CT and MRI becomes more to the same level. With MRI, like you can see in this patient, we can really easily see the soft tissue trauma near the fracture side, the fracture itself is not quite that easy to detect, but with help of these special sequences, it is still visible. Compared to conventional radiographs, both spine and pelvis are regions where we often are in trouble diagnosing acute non-displaced fractures. Similarly to intracranial 
structures also in the spine when we have contrast enhancing lesions they can be detected with both MRI and CT if the contrast enhancement is strong enough and the lesion is big enough. That being said, MRI, of course, is the imaging modality of choice when we are dealing with anything within the spinal cord, if it is available. With discospondylitis, early detection is important and MRI is excellent for diagnosing these in a timely manner with improved contrast enhancement, especially when we add on with fat-saturated post-contrast sequence. In the early stage, the vertebral in-plate changes might not be that readily visible, but the soft tissue reaction surrounding and within the vertebral canal is very easily detectable. And with special sequencing also, the focus on the vertebral end plates becomes more visible. CT is not quite that detailed in the soft tissue information, but still we do see the soft tissue changes also in CT if they are, again, strong enough, but we are not quite as specific with the type of changes with CT compared to MRI. Whereas we, if we compare it to conventional radiographs, it is not very sensitive nor specific in acute stage. And this patient had had symptoms for already two months before the diagnosis was made with radiographs. When we talk about bones, we often say CT is the imaging modality of choice, but that is more of changes when it comes to cortical bone. When we have changes that involve the bone marrow, the story could be different. This, these images were given by Silke Hecht, a colleague in VETCT and Tennessee University. And as you can see, on both of these patients, the CT shows nothing. Whereas in STIR and post-contrast T1 sequences, we see hyper-intense cortical sparing lesions on both round cell neoplasia and fungal infection. And with that, I'm going to finish with the summary when to choose CT or MRI. It depends on multiple factors and there is a significant overlap which I guess is a good thing if you only have one or the other. Uh, which body region you are interested in? What type of pathology are you suspecting? What is your clinical question? Anesthesia, is the patient uh, okay with it? And what other factors there are? And if you have any questions, I am happy to try to answer them. Thank you so much, Mimi. <clears throat> We've got a couple of questions. Uh, let me just get it up for you. Uh, Sarah is asking, can you cover the basic indications for using contrast for CT um, and when it is not needed? Should you always use it for thorax and apto or only for certain suspected pathologies? Thank you for the excellent question. Mm, I guess this is a bit dependable on radiologist, but I am a big fan of using contrast because CT does not have very good soft tissue resolution. And my background comes from ultrasound where the soft tissue resolution is really good. Um, that being said, there are cases where the use of intravenous contrast media is, well, contraindicated, or at least you should be careful when using it, which is when the patient is severely hypovolemic, dehydrated, has severe renal issue or congestive heart failure, etc. because uh, the ionized contrast media has the risk of damaging the kidneys. So at least you should check the renal values and the overall clinical assessment health on the patient and if you still need to use the contrast agent, what you can do, and probably in many clinics you already do, is 
hydrate the patients before and during and after. Uh, and in indications, that is more difficult. I'd say, well, it does help so much with the soft tissue. So, for example, going to thorax, whether you know what type of pathology you will be dealing with, uh, the contrast helps us to detect, for example, the lymph nodes better, or if there is any lesions in the pleura or lungs, it will outline them better. So would be indicated in the soft tissue reconstructions. We don't need it for the bone and lung series. In abdomen, if there's no contraindications, uh, I would use it because, again, it will help us to detect many anatomical structures. In the spine, I think there are two types of radiologists, those who use it and those who don't. Personally, I do believe in Tobias Schwarz and uh, their study, which said that uh, even without the use of CT myelography, uh, the extruding disc material and the inflammation it causes is better visible with the help of intravenous contrast. And there's probably plenty of other areas that you could cover. I'd say there's no harm of using it if the patient is healthy. And if there's anything on the contraindication side, then you need to consider what's the risk and benefit ratio. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Um, that was quite a comprehensive summary of, of um, from, from uh, for Sarah. Um, and just uh, the next question is from Lindsay. How much information do you believe we are missing with a CT scan for diagnosis of lumbosacral spinal disease compared to MRI imaging? Thank you. That's an excellent question. And I politically <laughs> left that part out from my presentation also to save time because it is under a debate with every time there is a new publication on that topic. But the current understanding is that we should get similar level of information with both modalities if we have uh, a good scan protocol and patient positioning and uh, with lumbosacral disease I guess uh, depending on whether it's a young or older patient and what type of pathology we are dealing with also uh, dynamic information so neutral extended flexed and that information is often easier to gain with CT but when we are dealing with for example nerve roots leaving from the vertebral canal MRI if we get the scan plane on the nerve root itself of course because it's soft tissue structure would be better but sometimes we struggle to show the nerve roots and with CT often but not always the nerve roots are surrounded by fat which will outline them nicely so we will see them. So if there's any gross changes like you saw in the trigeminal nerve uh, root tumor case on the head images that I showed, you can still see when something gets big. So I guess it depends on what type of pathology we are looking for and which publication we trust. Yeah, I hope that answers your questions, Lindsay, somewhat. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mimi. Uh, I'm just checking time. We're just about there. Any other questions or if there's anything specific, you can always um, email us on the um, sales at uh, vet-ct.com or info at vet-ct.com um, if there's anything specific. Um, and then otherwise, we should have this uh, recording on the YouTube channel, um, as David mentioned earlier, uh, by tomorrow or by the end of the week. the morning session the person who asked me about the hip dysplasia and ct compared to radiographs i did dig it up on my rumbling answer so there are some publications and information but the conclusion was that it's kind of inconclusive currently <laughs> but uh yeah not going too much into detail to that because orthopedics was left out of this speech but Jennifer, if you hear this, you can contact us again. <laughs> okay.
Thank you, Mimi. And thank you for going back to one of the questions from this morning, uh, this morning's session. That's very useful. Um, if there's no more questions, then we will uh, we'll end it there and allow you to enjoy your evening, Mimi. But thank you very much for the interesting session. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, as Will Marie said, there will be a, co a, a copy of the webinar available through the VetCT YouTube channel. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.